welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com talks about how the precious metals have rallied and the Dow hitting a record high. The People's Party of Canada leader Maxime Bernier comments on what kind of financial direction he would like to see the nation go. He doesn't believe a few thousand farmers should keep Canada from getting a good NAFTA deal. Author of the second edition of When the Bubble Bursts, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash, Hilliard Macbeth, relates how Canada is not alone when it comes to housing bubbles. Wolf Street publisher Wolf Richter gives us his views on U.S. trade policies, interest rate hikes, and is the so-called Trump bump real? Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have company showcase updates from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray and Avon Resources President Jim Pettit. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. Work programs are underway in Finland and Canada. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol ADD, on Frankfurt symbol 82A1, and the OTCQB symbol ASDZF. Please visit our website arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. Our guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Always good to be with you, Jim. How are precious metals holding up? Well, uh, the looks as though the basing activity that we were hoping for is starting to come into play. The um, We had those really good spikes down in the middle of August uh, that were then uh, tested at the end of August and September with the mining stocks. And uh, now we've uh, we had our first really good bounce off the bottom, a gold gold rally, the better part of uh, $50. Uh, platinum had a, a 10% move off the bottom. And as we have been moving through the September period, uh, just had a pause in the pricing as we talked about last week and then this week a good uh, good correction back down to test the lows gold gave back um, a fibonacci retracement gave back 62 percent of its rally and then a nice upside reversal on friday we've got a brand new uh, sequential 13 signal that's a buy signal you don't get these very often uh we had a a really good one in the August low, um, a false one in July, and then you go all the way back to December of last year that uh, produced uh, sequential signals right in the bottom week. So looking as though there's a reasonable chance here for a move off the bottom. Now, in silver, uh, two weeks ago, we, we sent out a chart showing that it was setting up for its best rally since June. And uh, this week, uh, we're seeing exactly that. It managed to close at the best levels of the month as of Friday, a really nice upside move uh, from that perspective. Not seeing the much happening in terms of the silver stocks, but uh, the uh, silver-gold ratio definitely moving in uh, in favor of the silver market. And, you know, the, the best of the precious metals coming off the initial low was platinum, and it topped out here uh, against some pretty good resistance lines coming down from the January high and uh, has had a, 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 a uh, probably a four or five decline day decline off of that and it is uh, setting up for uh, likewise uh, the type of low that could produce uh, probably a multi-month rally if we were to take out the highs of the last two weeks then that would be a catalyst point for for an excellent run. And if we look at the two, there aren't a lot of platinum plays out there in terms of the equity market, uh, but uh, Sibonia and uh, Platinum Group Metals are the, uh, the two that I keep an eye on. They not only hit a resistance line similar to the platinum price, but those trend lines go back the better part of a couple of years. So, the, the setup there uh, probably is for something even more uh, explosive on the upside if they do start to move. Now, we've been watching commitment of traders numbers. 
uh, for the last couple of months, uh, we've seen that the speculators have been net short in terms of the gold market and the silver market, um, and the commercials have been net long. And those numbers, even as of the end of this week, we've got 23,000 net short positions in silver. You've got 18,000 net short speculative positions in gold. So we've got the catalyst there uh, for a significant run if we start to run the shorts. So the silver move on Friday uh, might be enough to start triggering that market. Gold really needs to get through the, the 1225 to 1230, but... Uh, you know, if if we do manage to do that, I think you could be looking for a little bit of fireworks there. The Dow hit record highs. What does that tell us about the market? Well, you know, a week ago we looked at it and said, okay, the uh, the Dow theory potential sell signal is gone because the uh, uh, industrials were now confirming on the upside with what the transports have been doing in the last couple of months. What we don't have here, though, is you don't have the leadership in the financials. And the good, strong markets, you'll typically see uh, the financial stocks, the banks, uh, and uh, uh, the the brokers doing well. But if we look at the those indices, uh, they've been not only underperforming, but they're actually starting to roll over. And the the XBD, uh, the broker dealers, um, are have ended up with. Uh, testing the lows of the last couple of months here as of the end of the week. And they're being led down by uh, things like E-Trade Financial and Ameritrade, which are where the individuals are out there doing their speculating and their day trading. Um, and so we're seeing that there's there's less activity over there, so volumes as a whole are down. The, um, the managers of funds like the J.P. Morgans have been holding up reasonably well but they've now started to roll over. So I think we need to be very cognizant here of where the supports are uh, in the broad market. In the Dow, uh, the lows that we put in here back on that second week of September, um, also on the S&P, um, was a good test of the moving averages. We like to use the 20-day moving average at this point in the cycle. Um, and so for both of those indices, that held in that second week of September. If that is violated at all here uh, in the, the coming week or two, I think we could see a decent correction. But, you know, trend is up, and until proven otherwise, um, you keep your stops underneath, keep them reasonably tight, but uh, make sure that you're not overcommitted. Ross, thank you so much for being on the show. Always a pleasure, Jim. I guess has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Coming up, People's Party Leader Maxime Bernier, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlant District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features to our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Maxime Bernier, leader of the new party, the People's Party of Canada, online at peoplespartyofcanada.ca. Maxime, welcome back to This Week in Money. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be with you. Maxime, can you tell us about your new party and why you decided to form it? Yes, for sure. You know, our party is based on the 
four principles, individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect, and fairness. So all our policies will be based on these uh, principles. And actually, people are coming to our party because they like our, our philosophy and our policies. It's the same policies that I put forward during the leadership campaign a year and a half ago. So uh, actually, we want to have bold reform in Canada. Uh, the party won't try, won't try to uh, uh, to uh, use uh, people's money, taxpayers' money, to uh, try to buy vote and to give a special privilege or money to a special interest group. So that's a big difference with us and the other party. And I'll give you an example. All the other parties in the House are for uh, the, the supply management system. And as you know, it's a system that it's a, a regressive tax on the poor. People in Canada are paying twice the price for poultry, milk, and eggs. And we want to, I'm the only politician in Ottawa who want to abolish that. And uh, being sure that people will pay half the price for these products. But the other parties try to please uh, 13,000 uh, dairy and poultry producers. And, and for me, I prefer to work for 35 million uh, of Canadians. And that's, that's the philosophy of the party, not to, pr to try to please special interest group, but working for the people. And that's why the name of our party is the People's Party of Canada. So I'm very pleased, and it's going very well. <clears throat> is the name of the party causing any controversy? Oh, in the beginning, some people were a bit surprised about that. Uh, I had a journalist who said, oh, Mr. Bernie, it is a communist party I, uh, because of the name. I said to that journalist, if uh, I don't know, I don't know anyone who's uh, think who thinks that Maxim Bernier is uh, is a communist. <laughs> As you know, I'm a free market guy. I believe in freedom and less government and a smarter government. So the name of the party is to reflect our philosophy, and our philosophy is to work for the people and uh, and not working for special interest group. And also, uh, <coughs> uh, people said, oh, maybe Maxim is uh, a kind of a populist politician. I said, you know, I don't have any problem with that, but call me a, a smart uh, populist politician because uh, we don't try to speak to uh, the emotions of Canadians, but we try to speak to uh, the intellect of Canadian with uh, very uh, uh, serious policies for this country and a bold reform that we need for having a, a more uh, prosperous country. How will the People's Party of Canada be different from the establishment parties? Oh, I just I just said that, you know, the, the establishment party, they don't want to have debate about the equalization formula. They don't want to have debate about another way to deliver health care services in this country. They don't want to have debate about abolishing corporate welfare. So that's part of our program. We're the only party who wants to fight for that. Well, I have to say, are the conservatives and liberals basically the same party with just different colors? I think so up to now. You know, the conservatives are like the liberal like. Uh, they don't have any philosophy. Uh, they are saying a lot of things, but uh, there's no uh, uh, deep uh, policies that will, uh, uh, that will help this country to have a smaller government and uh, more freedom in this country. Uh, they're, they're like the liberal, and they're like the liberal also. They're doing focus group to know what they believe in. They're doing polling to know what they believe in. in for us, we don't need to do that. Uh, we don't believe in that. We know the right policies for this country. It's, uh, it, it, will be, uh, it is a policy that is uh, based on less government and, and more freedom and lower taxes. So our economic platform, it's very different than the conservative one. They, they want to give a special tax credit to a special group of the population to buy their vote. For us, we don't believe in the credit, a boutique tax credit. We believe in a flat tax for entrepreneur at 10%. We believe in a two tax rate for, for Canadians, one at 15%, the other one at 25%. So we have a, a strong proposal, but the Liberals and the Conservatives, they, they, they don't speak about that. So for me, and they're the same. We'll have more with Maxime Bernier next on This Week in Money. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of Power Band Solutions. 
Power Band is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. Power Band Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Maxine Bernier. Maxine, does lower taxation and less regulation spur economic growth? We need that. We need that. You know, uh, it's the Canadians who are creating wealth and job in this country. It is not the government. So we need more private investment. Now we have less private investment coming from other countries to Canada uh, because of the Trudeau government, because of their tax rates, because of their um, big deficit. Uh, so, as you may know, and Canadian, uh, the Canadians, they know that also, that uh, the deficit of today, uh, that will be the tax uh, of tomorrow. And so we'll have to pay a lot of taxes to pay back that huge deficit. So that's why we need big reform that will have, where we will have a smaller government and, and will be able to lower taxes. So that's very important for us. Uh, and I believe in economic freedom. I believe in more competition. I believe in an open market. I believe in foreign investment coming to Canada to, 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 and to create jobs. So uh, I believe in free, free trades. And actually, the, the Trudeau government, we don't know if they believe in a free trade with the U.S. right now because they have the solution. If they want to have a free trade with the Americans, uh, they need to put on the table the cartel of supply management that would be good for Canadian consumers, like I said before, but that will uh, uh, be good for the Canadian economy because right now 20% of our economy, it is at risk with, uh, <coughs> with uh, that deal with the U.S., the free trade with the U.S., because as you know, 20% of our GDP is depending on trade with the U.S. So <coughs> that's our economic platform. It's a strong platform, very different than the other, the other old uh, parties. Do you believe Canada should accept Trump's original offer of no barriers whatsoever? Yes, for sure. That must be the start of the negotiation. You know, <clears throat> a free trade discussion, it is, it, is, it is a discussion for having more freedom, for being sure that Canadians, if they want to buy uh, a product a product from the U.S., they, they must have the right to buy it. So it's a freedom of choice for Canadian consumers. And and that's that's why countries are, are, are richer, because they, they are able to trade. And uh, I believe in free trade, so the best one would be to have no trade barriers if we start the negotiation with that that will help and that's that's why i'm a little bit upset not a little bit i'm upset that the federal government is not putting on the table that cartel on the poultry for poultry eggs and, and milk uh, Canadians must have the right to buy, buy uh, American milk if they want, uh, and they must have the right uh, producer that are producing uh, our milk here in Canada. They must be able to export. Now they're not able to export because of that system. So if you believe in free trade, you must, you must put that on the table and start in the negotiation uh, uh, by, by being serious about freer trade. Do you think Canada would be a lot more prosperous if we had true free trade? Oh, for sure. And, and we have a challenge also inside our, our country. We don't have a real free trade in Canada, and that's a shame. <clears throat> After more than five, 150 years, uh, we don't have any uh, free trade in this country. Uh, that's a shame. That was the foundation of the party. The father of our constitution decided to create this country <clears throat> for <clears throat> actually being an economic union, and we're not an economic union. So we must be, we must be sure. And, and, and work with provinces for having a real free trade in Canada. And, uh, and that's something that uh, it is not uh, a, priori a priority of the Trudeau government right now. We'll have more with Maxime Bernier when This Week in Money returns. 
Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Maxime Bernier. Maxime, if the Trudeau government does not get a trade deal with the U.S., will Canadian jobs and the Canadian dollar be in jeopardy? Yes, it is right now, actually. You know, because of uh, all that uncertainty around that uh, trail deal, uh, business people are not investing in Canada right now. And if we don't have a deal, they will invest in the U.S. and they will create jobs in the U.S. So that's having an impact right now on, on the future of our country. <clears throat> Canadians are concerned about social programs. Can you uh, streamline the bureaucracy, Mean what, which should give you, in theory, more money to actually get the benefits to the people who need them? Yes, you're right. Uh, but if we if we want to be sure to be able to have all the social programs that we're having in Canada, we need to be able to pay for that. And that's why we need more economic growth. That's why we need a government under control. We need to have surplus to be sure that in the future we'll be able to pay for these social programs that are important for Canadians. So, you know, we need to have more economic growth because if we have more economic growth, the government will be able to be raise a little bit more money and will be able to, to look and to, to, to spend the money where, where Canadians want us to spend the money. So uh, in, in, our, in our platform, we have a foreign policies, a policy that is very different than the other uh, uh, parties in Ottawa. We want to help Canadians first. We want to stop foreign aids and just being there when there's a, a disaster or natural disaster. But, you know, why giving money to, I don't know, um, a country in, in, uh, in Africa to build road? It is not the work of, and the job of Canadian citizens to build, build road in Africa. So I think we must use the money to help our poor people here in Canada. So we, we, we believe in foreign aid, but when it is necessary and, and when when, I don't know, a natural disaster happen. Why do you think there's a big push for immigration when Canadians are out of work or homeless? Yeah, first of all, uh, this country has been built by immigrants, and, and we must be proud, and people coming from different countries, and, and that's a great country, and people are coming here to share our Canadian values and our culture, and that's perfect. But uh, I think and we must question always uh, the, 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 the position of the Trudeau government that they want always more and more immigrants. You know, now this year we'll have 310,000 new Canadians. And in two years from now, that would be 340,000 new Canadians. And Trudeau, the Trudeau government received a report, the Barton report, where they, they are asking the federal government to have 450,000 new Canadians. And I'm questioning that. I said, you know, we must maybe go back of the average of the new Canadians that we had under Stephen Harper, around 250,000 a year. And I'm the only politician, and we are the only party in Ottawa who wants to have a little bit less immigration, to be sure that the people who are coming to Canada will integrate our, our society, will be part of our society, will have a job. That would, be, that would be good for themselves first, but for the Canadian economy also at the end. So we have a, an immigration policy that is different than the other parties, but I'm saying at the same time, you know, we are open to immigration, but we want sure that the people who are coming to this country will be able to have a job and also will, uh, will be able to share our Canadian values. Would allowing more private health care providers help cut down on long waiting lists? <laughs> But I think, you know, it's not, it's not the federal government who will allow that. It's a decision that will come from provinces. But what we can do, 
we can, you know, stop uh, stop transferring money at the federal level to provinces for health care. That's their jurisdiction in the Constitution. We must respect the Constitution and, and let uh, the provinces uh, taxing their own citizens for their own jurisdiction. So what I want to do in health care, I want to lower the, 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 the taxes at the, the tax at the federal level. So, and instead of taxing Canadians and after that giving that back to provinces, I will lower, we will lower the, the, the taxes at the federal level. Canadians will pay less taxes at the federal level, but provinces will be able to uh, have a tax room and they will, they will be able to tax their own citizens for their own responsibility. And I think that's important to do that reform, and that will give a, 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 a right, the right incentive for provinces to develop their uh, health care delivery of services with maybe more public delivery or less public delivery. But that will be their decision because... They would, they won't be able to come back and ask always for, for more money, uh, at the federal level. And Canadians will know who to blame if they don't like the health care delivery of services, services that they're receiving. And now they don't know who to blame. Is it the federal government because we're not giving enough money to a province? Or is it a province because they're not able to manage the, the health care uh, system? So, like that, people will know who to blame, and that will be the province, and uh, that will put uh, the right incentive uh, to the province to maybe find other alternatives to uh, be more efficient, like maybe in the European countries where they have a universal <clears throat> Healthcare care uh, 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 programs, uh, but with private delivery and public delivery at the same time, and they don't have uh, waiting times uh, for surgery like we are having in Canada. So that will give an incentive to provinces to develop maybe uh, another system more efficient. But it won't be a decision by the federal government. The only decision will be to stop taxing Canadian and transferring that money to provinces. We'll lower our taxes at the federal level, and provinces will be able to increase their own taxes for their own uh, responsibility. Are you okay with the legalization of medical and recreational marijuana? I think it's a dumb deal. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, put the two pace back in the in the tube i think it's it's a done deal and uh, uh, but maybe we can improve that bill so i'll look at it as you know i voted against that bill because i didn't like uh, the way the bill was, dra- was drafted uh, but uh, it, it will be legal in a couple of days from now so from there we'll have to improve and and, and look at look at a new bill to uh, be sure that uh, we respect provincial jurisdiction and we have a bill that will answer a lot of questions that uh, I had uh, during uh, the reading of that bill in the House. Have you thought about setting up a forum on your website where people can make <clears throat> suggestions and where you can cut wasteful government spending? I don't have a forum, but it's a good idea. But people can uh, uh, write on my web. First of all, they can go on the website of the party, peoplespartyofcanada.ca. Uh, they can email us at info at info at peoplespartyofcanada.ca and giving us uh, their idea. So that would be useful. Yes, it would be uh, it would be great. But also, people can become a member of our party, and if they want, uh, they will be uh, funding members and. And they can do that until the 1st of November and <clears throat> participate in a new party with a strong uh, free market uh, platform. Maxime, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for giving me that opportunity. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. My guest has been Maxime Bernier, leader of the <clears throat> People's Party of Canada, online at peoplespartyofcanada.ca. Coming up, the author of the second edition of When the Bubble Burst Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash, Hilliard Macbeth, next on This Week in Money. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. 
Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth, Portfolio Manager in Edmonton and author of the second of edition of When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. His book is available in bookstores and online. Hilliard, welcome back to This Week in Money. Nice to be talking with you. I'm in uh, actually in Toronto right now on my way back to Edmonton. Hilliard, you've just come from a very interesting conference. Can you tell us about it? So the um, the annual conference of a company or a, an organization called the BCA Research, uh, which is stands for Bank Credit Analyst. It was founded in 1949, and every other every year it's actually um, at this time it's held uh, almost always before it's been in New York. But this year, for some reason, they moved it to Toronto, so they they had a little more Canadian content this time. And um, they I was lucky enough to get invited to present. So there's about probably 12 presenters in total over two days. And um, I was I was a little nervous because it's a big crowd, 300 uh, investors and portfolio managers from all over the world, quite a few from Europe and quite a few from the U.S., Australia, New Zealand. Uh, but I think it went well. And uh, one of the things that I noticed was they were very interested in the housing bubble idea in Canada because, for instance, the people in Australia and New Zealand have the same thing there as well. And I talked to one fellow from Sweden, and, or sorry, from uh, Denmark, and they have... Uh, Similar problem in Denmark with housing prices uh, too expensive for most people, and that ties in, of course, with uh, the new edition of your book when the bubble bursts, surviving the Canadian real estate crash. Yeah. So what I did in that, so that was the first time I presented with the new material from the second edition, and what I did was I, um, I, I in the second edition, I brought out the the, the questions about. Um, why is it that these bubbles keep occurring and what is it, what flaw is there in the regulatory or economic theory, uh, department that allows people to, to, uh, allow these bubbles to keep happening? And then afterwards say, how did that happen? Nobody could see that coming, right? So, so, um, the main problem in the economic theory and the regulatory structure is a misunderstanding about where money actually comes from. So people think that the central bank prints the money. And then it gives them some money to the banks, and then the banks lend it out, or people, the banks raise deposits from people and then lend it back out to people that want to buy a house. But that's not actually the way it works. What really happens is when the bank makes a loan, it creates brand new money, literally out of thin air. So when you sign the mortgage document, the money magically appears in your bank account. And I'm sure most people have experienced that. So the problem with that is if it goes into non-productive, or what, what uh, some professors call financial transactions, there's no limit to the bubble it can create because there's no there's no restraint on it. There's no restraint to the central bank. And there's no restraint in terms of having to find deposit money in order to to um, uh, make the loan. There, the bank really has no limit other than a few regulatory limits, which are generally pretty loose. So that's how bubbles get created. And any any country where the banking structure is like that. Australia is a really good example, as well as Canada. Um, there's really no limit to how high the housing market can go, except for uh, when it reaches the point where people start defaulting on their loans. And then, of course, then the whole th- the whole thing works in reverse. Then, when they default on their loan, uh, money that was created out of thin air gets destroyed, and the total amount of money in the economy uh, starts to shrink. And that's very dangerous for the economy. That leads to really bad things happening. So, so when I presented that to this crowd, uh, there's always, I mean, pretty, pretty much uh, always when you start talking about um, that theory or that that theory about how money is created, there's always a lot of people that learn the textbook version, which is very different, and they get really upset. But I, I didn't have anybody during the talk get really upset with me. But afterwards, people came up and said, "Well, you know, the textbook says this," so then I have to. Uh, go through and correct it but um but yeah it was very successful and and one of the things that they do at those conferences is they agree to buy enough copies of the, of your book if you're the speaker to give one to each of the um each of the uh, attendees so there were something like 200 books at the back of the room i think and uh the conference opened at 8 30 in the morning monday morning and by nine o'clock all of my books all the copies of my books were my book was gone so and i I'm sure none of these people knew who I was, so it must have been the topic, you know, when the bubble burst surviving the Canadian real estate crash. So that obviously struck a, a nerve with a lot of the attendees, and uh, certainly people came up to me afterwards and asked me about it. I could tell they're very interested in the topic. 
there were some pretty notable people at that conference. Well, some of the other presenters were the former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. He was the, the keynote um, a speaker on the Monday night, and it was a two-day conference. And then Janet Yellen kicked off the conference, the former Federal Reserve Chairman, on uh, Monday morning. And then my turn came up on Tuesday afternoon. So, um, they, so they had different. I mean, obviously they weren't all at the level of Stephen Harper and Janet Yellen, uh, but they had a lot of really good speakers. There was one fellow that um, he's a uh, academic, I think, from Austria, and he has written a book called The Great Leveler. And uh, the book is about um, in, in about like um, like um, inequality in society. So income and wealth inequality, which is kind of the norm, as we're learning now. You know, we know that inequality has been getting a lot worse, especially in the United States, but even in Canada and other places. So he goes back centuries and examines um, how bad it is. And, of course, we're in a space where it's getting worse. But the, the bad news is, if you if you think that things should be more equal, so a lot of people don't, but I, I, I think it's better if things are more equal. Um, the bad news is the only way that things get leveled out is during war or revolution or things like the bubonic plague. <laughs> so, so, so the, the good news is that sometimes the things get leveled out, but the bad news is it takes something pretty drastic for, uh, for the poorer people to catch up to the rich people. Are the real estate booms in Canada and around the world ending? Well, that was the topic they wanted me to talk about at this conference. So I, so I, I highlighted several countries, um, a little bit on China, but Australia I spent quite a bit of time on. And, uh, of course, we had the, the boom in Japan that ended in 1990. So there were 20 years in um, in a crash, a long, slow crash in Japan. And uh, then I mentioned one country, uh, Germany, that has not had a bubble and therefore will not have a crash. So the other countries like that is Italy. So, by the way, if you're looking to buy that villa in Tuscany, now is a great time because Italian real estate prices are extremely uh, reasonable right now. So... So the bubbles that are around the world, they're Norway, um, Denmark, I already mentioned Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Uh, it looks like they are, and the reason would be if they did... Now, I don't think they would end simultaneously, even, with, even within Canada, the, the bubble is not ending simultaneously. But um, the major factor is goes back to the way that uh, real estate uh, purchases are funded, which is through bank loans, and it depends on the status of the banks, the regulatory rules around the banking. And of course, we know in Canada, um, the right rules have been tightened lately. And um, uh, people may know or they may not know that in Australia, they have a Royal Bank, a Royal Commission on Banking underway right now. And they're uncovering all kinds of problems, uh, fraud, mortgage fraud. And uh, they're actually laying criminal charges uh, against some of the banks and some of the bankers. So I suspect that the um, Australian housing bubble is already on its way to bursting. Uh, because obviously the people that are in, working in the banks are, have a big impact. The rules, but there's there's regulatory rules that are imposed on banks, but then there's also the attitude of the people working at the banks. And um, up until maybe a year and a half, two years ago in Canada, it was kind of full speed ahead. But now probably the people that work in the banks are getting a little worried that uh, maybe some of these people taking out these loans can't, can't pay the money back. If house prices are not rising, then they can't fall back on the attitude. Well, I don't care if the if the borrowers can pay the money back because they can always seize the house and sell it. So if house prices level off, they don't even have to go down a whole lot, just level off or go down a little bit. Then the bankers start changing their attitude towards the loans that they're willing to make. They get a lot more cautious because they're afraid of losing their jobs if they make too many bad loans. And uh, that appears to be happening in Australia. It looks like it's happening in, in Vancouver and Toronto and probably in other parts of Canada soon, if not already. And uh, I don't know if Sweden, Norway, and Denmark and some of those other countries have turned yet. Um, in New Zealand, they have a new government. And uh, it's so bad there that it's become a political issue, very, very uh, big political issue with um, the new government taking over, actually putting in some really drastic measures and uh, that'll probably bring the house house prices down there but they are they're like we think we have it bad in canada it's like twice as bad in new zealand what kind of damage can a bursting housing bubble do to a country's economy so it depends on how big the real estate um segment is now canada is one of the biggest in the world so the direct 
investment in real estate is about 8%, 7.5 to 8%, which is the highest it's been ever in Canada. And to give you an idea, the peak in the U.S. was 6%, so we're already at 8%. We're always, we're already 30% higher than the peak in the U.S. And after the bubble burst in the U.S., the direct investment is in real estate. So that's new housing and uh, renovations and a few other little things. Um, it dropped from, from 6% all the way down to 2%. So it was a, basically a, a 66% drop in that part of the GDP. And that was what well, we saw it triggered a global financial crisis. So Canada has been above 6% for now for a decade, between 6 and 8% for a full decade. So if we lost even half of that, if our, we went from 8% to 4%, it would be a huge hit to the GDP. And then, of course, you've got all the related things. Um, that there's there's a whole bunch of other people that are connected to the real estate segment that's not in that um, and not directly in that uh, category. And estimates in Canada are that's as high as 14% of the of the GDP. So, to, just to say, take a rough guess, like if it dropped from 14% down to 7%, that would be a 7% hit to GDP, which would be a major recession. And so, the real estate sector alone could trigger a recession in Canada that would be pretty harsh. And you know, one of the one example of of how it might play out is um, uh, one of the biggest groups of speculators in the real estate industry in terms of owning second and third homes and, and trying to flip them or rent them out are people that actually work in the real estate industry themselves. So they got a double whammy. They got the their sales commissions are down because they're not selling as many houses. And then on top of that, um, their their investment isn't isn't as good as it was. And the same with the construction industry. Construction industry, in my experience People I've talked to often will have um, will have a little project on the side where they buy houses and fix them up and then try and sell them. So, so it it can be a very difficult thing. The other the other area that would be probably um, something to watch for is the strain on families where the older generation has helped the jump younger generation. Um, now the older generation might be retired or close to retirement. It could really affect their um, their retirement in a negative way if the younger generations get into trouble. I'm sure they'll feel obligated to help them out. Who gets hurt in a real estate crash? Well, you know, the the uh, the people that uh, get hurt the most are the people that have the most debt. So you'd, you'd say the people that bought in the last five to six to seven years who paid the highest prices uh, and probably borrowed the most amount of money uh, would be the ones that were most likely to get hurt, plus the people that work directly in the industry, like the uh, the construction workers, the realtors that operate on commission, the lawyers that depend on real estate transactions for their income, the people that work at banks and credit unions and that sort of thing, the uh, the shadow lenders. There's a whole 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 industry of shadow lending related to real estate where people put loans out at 10%. We've talked about it in the past, um, usually to builders or uh, people in the housing industry, and of course a lot of those loans will go sour. So it's a it's a uh, there's a, a very broad group of people that would, would get hurt. I think it'll affect pretty much every family in, in Canada. What role do home equity loans play in real estate crashes? So home equity loans um, are about 250 to 275 billion dollars, and uh, mortgages are about 1.5 trillion. So home equity loans are only about a fifth of the size of the uh, mortgage, the regular mortgage business. Um, but they could be, uh, have a quite a big impact because the, unlike the mortgages, in the case of home equity loans, they are interest only loans and they can be, uh, the bank can demand repayment. They can be modified. Uh, the bank can come to you and say, well, we're putting your interest rate up or we want you to repay. There's a little bit of a debate whether the banks ever would say we want you to repay the loan, but, but, um, it isn't as permanent as a mortgage. So therefore, uh, it's, it's, it could be the, um, the more volatile section. Plus a lot of the, a lot of the home equity loans, I believe, and I don't have the, uh, I don't know how to check this, but just from talking to hundreds of Canadians in the last four years, I would say that an awful lot of those are probably older people that have taken out a home equity loan to get money to give, um, down, help with down payments to younger people in their family. So that would be a, uh, doubly painful. If the home, if the if the deposit, if, if the down payment on the mortgage is lost because house price declines by say 20%, and then the um, the older generation 
has a big chunk of their money that they have to repay, uh, which delays their retirement. It, it, that's, that, it could play a role that way. But in terms of the overall, it's, it's only about a fifth the size of the mortgage industry, so it wouldn't be as, um, as impactful as, 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 uh, as the mortgages would be. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth when This Week in Money returns. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, the Canadian federal election's about a year away with very high mortgage and consumer debt along with a housing bubble. What should voters be looking for a year from now when they go to the polls? Well, you know, it's interesting that I don't know that there's been a housing correction or a housing crash where the government has managed to get reelected in the middle of it. So given that it, it looks like um, real estate prices in Toronto uh, peaked about April of 2017 and single ho- family homes in Vancouver peaked in sometime in the summer of 2016. Um, and uh, Edmonton and Calgary, of course, have been struggling with, uh, with weak house prices for several years now. Um, if that were to gain a little bit of momentum, I think it would be very difficult for the government to get reelected. One of the things that came out of this conference, um, and actually this former Prime Minister Stephen Harper mentioned this, was um, the attitude towards immigration and the attitude towards um, trade deals. So there's actually quite a bit of negative feeling about um, China in terms of trading with China. In the case of Vancouver, it would be with foreign investment coming into our real estate markets. And uh, what he was saying sounded almost like he was praising Donald Trump. Um, he was saying that um, Trump has, has put his finger on two of the hot-button issues in, in, the, um, in the economy and in people's minds in terms of uh, things that are bothering him the most. So people are still angry about what happened in the global financial crisis 10 years ago. It's not as bad in Canada because there wasn't any uh, blatant uh, bailout of Wall Street kind of equivalent in Canada, although there was a... As a as, I, as you and I have talked before, there was a kind of behind-the-scenes bailout, but the public isn't aware of it. So it didn't hurt anybody politically. But um, but certainly the, I, I, the potential is there for immigration and um, trade to be big issues in the in the uh, in the next election. But uh, Harper said, and I think he's right about this, that uh, if the economy is good, you, you, it's really hard to screw up. If the economy is bad, it's really hard to do anything right. So um, I think probably a year from now, um, the forecast at the at the conference, there was a number of uh, um, highly regarded forecasters that indicated that the recession in the U.S. is likely to come in late 2019 or early 2020. So a year from now, um, might be they might skate through without having a, a difficult economy, but I, the odds are the other way. I think the odds are that the uh, housing correction plus uh, maybe a recession in the U.S., um, could catch up to them before the vote, in which case it's going to be very tough for the uh, the people in power now to to keep power. Would Canada need to have a booming economy to cushion the impact of a housing crash? Yeah, it's going to be very difficult to cushion that. The real estate sector is so large, and of course we don't have the booming oil and gas sector now. One of the one of the forecasters at the um, at the conference was indicating that there's a chance because of the new sanctions on Iran. The difficulties with shale oil and getting the shale out of Texas. Um, there's lots of oil, but they don't have the pipeline, pipeline volume to get the, the, the oil from 
the shale part of Texas, which is the extreme west side of Texas, which is quite a ways away. It's like uh, you know, 500 miles or something to the uh, to the ocean. They don't have the pipeline capacity in place, and I'm sure Canadians can identify with that. Um, but uh, so he thought that that might cause a problem with the. Um, he thought that might cause a problem with the uh, with the oil price, which would indicate that there could be as much of a, as much as a hundred dollars a barrel uh, could be the price for a while. Now, that would be the good news for for Canada and the oil industry in Canada. The bad news is every time that's happened before, when the Federal Reserve is going through a tightening cycle where interest rates are rising, there's been a recession triggered by that fairly soon afterwards. So, so um, it's um, it's a uh, and of course, we haven't talked about NAFTA yet, so that's that's the big factor in this thing is probably is NAFTA. Right, with a new NAFTA deal becoming less likely, could this have a greater effect to the downside for a housing crash and for the Canadian dollar? Well, for sure, I was um, uh, I was talking to some of the people in here in Ontario, and uh, the uh, you know they are quite concerned about NAFTA, and it looks less and less like there's going to be a deal. It's a uh, it's hard to understand why the U.S. is acting this way. It doesn't seem rational at all. But um, and there are some. Um, it's not all negative with NAFTA. There, there is the agreement um, replaced the uh, the free trade agreement that Canada and the U.S. had, which includes which includes um, the auto parts and auto manufacturing. However, the U.S. has come up with this new thing called the national security. Um, Exemption, and that means they can apply for tariffs of 25% based on national security um, concerns. Now, it doesn't make any sense that Canada would be viewed as a national security threat, uh, but they can get away with it for a while. And of course, what would happen is it would go to a tribunal and it would be overturned eventually. But in the meantime, it'd be very difficult for the. Uh, so the combination of those two uh, would be very hard for the Canadian economy, and, I, and, and the Canadian dollar was the last part of that question. Um, I, I think the consensus is that we would lose, uh, it's currently at about 77 cents, so it, it, we would lose probably 4 or 5 cents. I would, I, you know, I don't think included in that forecast is uh, the impact of a, of a housing crash at the same time. If it, if, it, if it were the combination of the two, the housing crash and, and the NAFTA failure, we'd probably be looking into uh, somewhere in the high 60s or the mid 60 cents range, which is Pretty severe, but we have been there before. We got there a couple of times before in the last 20 years. And um, the good news is it would actually help the exporters. So, um, But having said that, in the middle of a, a correction like that, the federal government would have to get involved and s- spend quite a bit of money to help different industries survive and, and some households as well. Um, there is some good news on that part. The uh, federal government is actually in pretty good shape financially. The, the provinces are in terrible shape, except maybe for B.C., but the federal government's in good shape. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth next on This Week in Money. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Vatic Ventures Corp. is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatic's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, have Canadians become addicted to debt? Well, it certainly seems like it. The, the growth rate of the debt, there's a, a study done by the uh, David McDonald at the CCPA about, uh, I guess, about a year ago now. And um, in the second edition, I I uh, talk about that that issue. And the growth rate in the debt, and this is private sector debt, so this is not just 
household debt, which is what we usually talk about when we talk about mortgages and HELOCs, but also corporate sector debt. And corporate sector debt in the last couple of years has actually been increasing faster than uh, household debt. But the combination of those two had been increasing at about 4% faster than GDP for a number of years. So over over five years, the growth rate was about 20% faster than GDP. And this this is actually surprising how little impact we got for that because um, it should have caused us to have a booming economy, but it didn't really. But it did save us from having a recession. So um, now that the now that what's changed in the last year since since that that study was done is that the growth rate in that debt has slowed down dramatically. So instead of it growing at four um, percent a year faster than GDP, it's probably growing at about one or two percent faster than GDP, and it's still slowing. So once it once it dips below the rate of growth of the GDP. Generally, uh, it would be really hard to avoid a recession because that extra debt that Canadians are taking on is what keeps the economy going. And uh, it really means that people have just basically cut out a lot of extras like uh, restaurant meals and travel and new cars. And uh, and they just concentrate on paying down their, their debts and their, their car loans, their credit cards and their mortgages. Um, it's been a long time since that happened. Uh, so we don't really know. Uh, what it's going to look like. But the last time it happened, um, it caused uh, a recession. It was in the early 1990s. So um, I think it'll have a big impact to answer the question. How deeply in debt are Canadians? One of the one of the biggest in the world. So the, um, the private sector debt is the way we measure it. Um, we're at about 220% of GDP. Australia, which has a even bigger housing bubble than we have, is about 200% of GDP. And so we're... 10% deeper into debt than Australia, and they're they're not uh, shy on taking on debt because they love real estate like we do. Um, so um, in the past, like for instance, giving an idea that the U.S. peaked out at 180% of GDP, uh, and they had a horrible housing crash and triggered a global financial crisis, and we're 40 percentage points higher than they were at their peak. So the other places that have gotten up to 220% was Japan, just before the 1989 peak of, of their bubble, and um, countries like Spain, just before the global financial crisis. So anytime, uh, basically anytime um, any country has gotten up to 200% or more of private sector debt to GDP, um, there's been a recession and that followed. And, and in several cases, there's been a financial crisis as well. Is the modern day slave the debt slave? Yeah, you know, tr- people basically have traded. Um, uh, I guess working for the like working for the landlord or working for the for the, um, the in the feudal system for being serfs to the um, to the lord of the manor kind of thing uh, to um, being slaves to their debt and to the bank, and uh, they voluntarily did that. I mean, it was the, they didn't have to do it. There, there was a lot of advertising and. There was a lot of temptation put in front of them, but uh, they willingly volunteered. It wasn't like they were um, uh, drugged and thrown into a slave ship and carried off. Uh, but um, but uh, it is a modern form of slavery. As, as, as one economist put it, um, they, they've decided to trade paying rent to the landlord to paying rent to the bank. And, and uh, you know, the bank is, 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 is less... Uh, understanding than most landlords. Most landlords, if there's a recession on or something, they probably would, you probably could go and talk to them and say, you know what, I can't pay, I can't pay the same rent I've been paying you, but I'll pay you what I can and they could probably work out a deal. Uh, partly because the landlord doesn't really have any other tenants lined up to, to take his place, to take your place. But in the case of the banks, they can be, they usually are pretty ruthless when it comes to that. Now, in uh, the U.S., in the global financial crisis, there was a program brought in to help people with their um, with their excessive debt and to try and keep them in their homes, uh, it was brought in by the Obama government, and it didn't work. And uh, the reason it didn't work is because the, there's various um, fingers pointing, laying the blame, but there was, it was so heavily uh, regulated, and there were so many rules. I think the lenders weren't behind it. Uh, but something like that would have to happen, I think, in the, in the case of Canada, and hopefully we'd do a better job. Maybe we could learn something from what happened in the U.S. Because what's the point of throwing everybody out of their homes and foreclosing on their homes, uh, then trying to find somebody to rent that home, because it would be difficult to sell it. 
uh, you might as well uh, try and keep the same people in their homes, maybe turn them into renters and then give them an option of maybe, maybe um, you know, earning their way back into ownership again somehow. Uh, and I, I think there would be a way to do it. But sometimes the obstacles are people want to see, you know, when people can't pay their debts, sometimes people can get quite um, quite judgmental. And want, they want uh, some harsh penalties um, meted out to those people. So if, if, that, if that's the political, uh, if that's the way the political wind is blowing at the time, maybe there's nothing that the government could do. But I think it would be worth trying because uh, um, there's not a whole lot of point in having a whole bunch of people defaulting on their mortgages and um, the impact on the economy that that would cause. It looks like the U.S. is going to continue to hike interest rates. Is Canada likely to follow that lead? They pretty much have to. So the the um, on Wednesday of this week, the um, the Federal Reserve hiked the rates again, so we're up to two and a quarter percent. And um, I was looking at a chart at the conference of the um, the Canadian uh, Bank of Canada rate and the U.S. Federal Funds rate, and uh, basically they follow. They, Canada doesn't really have a, a choice. Um, uh, if we if we didn't follow the U.S. Federal Reserve higher. Um, our dollar would would sink uh, quite precipitously, probably maybe even ten cents from seventy seven down to sixty seven cents, and then we would we would have to hike rates anyway um, in order to protect the dollar from falling even further. So either way, we have to. If the U.S. is hiking rates, we have to. We're not the only ones in the in the world that are caught with this. It's worse for a lot of the um, a lot of the emerging market countries uh, because they've borrowed a lot of money in U.S. dollars and they they have to hike rates. This is one of the one of the main causes of some of these crises that have happened in the past, like Thailand in 1998 and, and uh, Russia that defaulted in 1990, I guess it was 1998, Russia in 1997 and Thailand. Um, so uh, I don't think Canada's in any danger of defaulting. I think the, we have a, still have our AAA credit rating, but uh, we can't avoid um, moving up when the U.S. moves up. It's pretty, basically, it's uh, we don't have any freedom in that in that regard. We hear that banks in Canada are being conservative, also known as constricting credit. Is that a warning sign for the housing market and the economy? Yeah, exactly. So going back to what I um, what I said about the um, the credit uh, growth, so that I was mentioning that the credit growth has been four percentage points faster than the GDP. So say the GDP is growing at two um, percent, the the credit was growing at um, at six percent a year, and and uh, so, if if things tighten up, I don't even think necessarily it's the Bank of Canada as much. It's certainly there's a there's a bit of a chill coming out from them. But they they generally don't. Um, they would be very unusual for them to actually step in and and say, "Oh no, you can't lend any more money." That's not their style. Uh, but uh, if that rate of growth of, of credit slows down, um, say from growing at six percent down to growing at two or three percent, that alone is enough to uh, to really cause trouble in the economy, and that's we're on this treadmill. We can't get off. Um, we can't keep growing the the debt. Um, they call it credit or debt. The same word, two words for the same thing. Um, we can't keep growing the the um, credit at that rate. But uh, if we don't, if we slow it down, then we'll have a recession. So there's no. It's really a treadmill we can't get off of, but we have to get off of it. What percentage of the Canadian economy is related to housing? So the the, um, the direct one, as we mentioned, is is, is close to eight percent, seven point five eight percent. The indirect, but people directly related to real estate, is um, is about fourteen percent. But what's happened over the last forty years, in uh, been coming up in a couple more weeks, I'll be forty years in the financial sector. Is the financial sector as a whole, including banks and uh, other lenders, shadow lenders, that sort of thing, the life insurance industry, um, all of that together, it's 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 up as high as 25% of GDP, and that's just that's like two and a half times higher than it was um, 40 years ago. So it, it's a it's a huge impact because all of those people are involved in real estate, like life insurance companies buy real estate as investments. It's um it's a real um it's a, it's a trend. That, they call it the term for it is called the financialization of the economy, and it's it's huge. It really is, and so uh, it's unfortunate because a lot of that um, a lot of that um, extra money 
has gone into just buying and selling real estate assets at higher and higher prices. And it doesn't really uh, inject any productive capacity into the economies. Instead of building, for instance, uh, new auto automobile manufacturing plants, as, as has been done in Mexico and the southern U.S., we were just building more condos and flipping them as as uh, speculation. So you can you, you can people can easily see that if you may if you take a loan out to build a new factory that's producing income, it's easy to repay the loan. But if you take a loan out to speculate in buying ten condos, um, the only way you could repay that loan would be is if you ha- were able to sell those condos or rent them out for really high rent. And, and both of those things in a real estate correction are going to be impossible. So those loans basically are going to be um, very difficult to repay, if not impossible to repay. Are we looking at inevitable job losses in the housing and related sectors? Oh, for sure. So in um, just take construction alone. So um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head for, for all of Canada, but for Alberta, uh, the peak was around 275,000 employees in the construction industry. Um, it slowed so far down to 240,000, but it'll slow further because the last oil sands plant was just um, the grand opening was last week of the Fort Hills plant. Um, in 2005, that number that's currently 240 down from 275 was 150. So that would imply that we probably got another, if we go back to the 2005 levels, which I wouldn't surprise me at all, um, that would be another 90,000 people. So roughly another 40% of construction workers would, would be laid off. Just as, and this isn't talking about a huge slump. This is just, sort of going back to a more normal average level. And if you take that across Canada, that would be a huge number of jobs. And, um, and because in, I was, uh, as we, as we said at the beginning, I'm, I'm just coming back from Toronto. There's 97 cranes on the horizon in Toronto, uh, actively and almost all of it is building residential buildings. Now, some of them are, are purpose built rentals, but most of them are condos. So in a housing correction, um, there wouldn't be any new construction. In that segment, and even some of the existing ones might might um, might get halted, uh, depending on what stage you're at. So, a construction alone would be a huge impact, but the, but the total real estate segment is more like three times that size. So it's going to have a huge impact. There's no question. How is the bursting of the housing bubble likely to affect the bubble cities like Vancouver and Toronto versus other cities? Well, the advantage that Toronto has is that so this stat. So this is kind of just came out with the new population growth, and there was uh, quite a large um, growth. So the growth, the stories about growing population, especially people in Toronto love to tell this story, uh, and it gets exaggerated. So the the growth for all of Canada was uh, 1.4%. It's one of the highest in the world, by the way. Um, in on average, in the up until about 2014, it was more like 1%, 1.1% in Toronto. So that'll help them a little bit. And so Toronto's kind of a magnet for immigration but it would only it would only solve the problem if if the, there were no more projects building and of course as i mentioned there's 97 cranes so they're they're really way more than enough to house all these new people but but um population growth will help uh but you know there's it's it's, it's uh and vancouver of course is considered this uh, destination that everybody loves to go to and, and and um so it's maybe got a little bit of protection in that regard but the, the, on the other side of the coin, in 1990 and 1994, housing prices in Toronto went down 30%. And in the mid to late 80s, a similar thing happened in Vancouver. So it, it doesn't make sense to believe that those cities are immune to um, to a housing crash. New York City, Manhattan, for example, it's in the middle of a correction right now. The high-end uh, high end condos are, are, are dropping uh, fairly substantial price drops of 10, 15, 20, 30% in some of the higher-end condos. And you're seeing the same sort of thing in the, in West Van and the and the more expensive homes. Um, for instance, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he did a survey in West Van, and there's currently um, he was going to do eight million and higher, but there's a lot of homes listed for seven point nine nine million. So he, he he ran the he ran the search on seven point nine million or higher. There's eighty one homes for sale, seven point nine million and above, in West Van, and um, 81 homes, of which 72 of them are brand new, have never been occupied. So those are, those are 72 homes that have been built on spec. And at that price level, it's very difficult to find a buyer, as, you, as I'm sure people can imagine. So 
that alone is enough to to weigh down the housing market in, in Vancouver for quite a long time to come when you've got all these high end car properties because when you compress it at the high end then of course all the way down the scale all the way down to the two million the one million and even below one million um, the prices get um, if not uh, pushed lower it just puts a cap on uh, what what people can sell them for so um, no it's the Toronto Vancouver they might do a little better than average uh, across Canada, but they're not immune to any correction, that's for sure. In the late 80s, the Japanese had a real estate bubble, and they snapped up every piece of real estate they could around the planet. Now the mainland Chinese have the same situation. Are the resulting outcomes likely to be different this time? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, that's the that's the thing that I covered in the, in the new edition of the book about how money is actually created. And the, what the Japanese figured out was that they could, they could using the banks, they could actually push new money into the into the uh, economy by directing the banks to l- lend money. Um, and this is as we talked, the, the the new money that's created just magically out of thin air. Uh, but the problem is, if you put it into uh, speculative real estate transactions, so what they were doing was they were saying to the corporations in Japan, "We want you to, we want you to borrow this money. We're insisting that you borrow it." But of course, eventually the corporations don't have enough good projects to uh, use the money for. So they start using the money to buy up real estate in, in California, and they bought the Pebble Beach Golf Course and all this stuff. And, of course, all of that stuff, you can't repay the loans with that. So so in China, uh, so that was that was the late the mid to late 80s, and it ended in a horrendous crash. In China, they, they have discovered the same thing. They used the banks to stimulate their economy. The government is very much involved in the, in the banks, the Every single bank in China is majority owned by the by the government. Although you can also buy shares in them, the government directs the um, the amount of loans that are pushed into the economy. And uh, now, but, but, but what will determine it is is have they been using that money for for good productive uses, or are they using it for speculative purposes? I don't I don't know I don't know enough about China. I I, I hear stories both ways. I hear they're doing a wonderful job of building lots of uh, trains, high-speed trains, airports, that sort of thing. But then, of course, I, I just heard a story yesterday about Japan and all these beautiful airports they have in Japan. They have no passengers, <laughs> so and that and that's left over from uh, 20 years ago or 20, um, maybe 25 years ago. So you can build too much. Somebody told me that Guangzhou. I've never been to China actually, but uh, Guangzhou is right near uh, Shenzhen, which is right near Hong Kong. Um, I said, imagine the Vancouver airport, and imagine it's all brand new, everything's perfect, and then imagine it ten times the size, and you get some idea of what Guangzhou looks like. So, now the problem in China is the average income is only twelve thousand dollars a year, so the people may not be able to afford to fly in, in and out of those airports. So, so uh, it, they could, they'll probably screw it up. But, well, but on the other hand, um, I have come to understand now that. Uh, and this is this is new for me actually, that they can keep it going for a lot longer than people than I realized uh, because uh, of the way that money is created. But eventually, if they create too many loans, they're used for uh, speculative purposes rather than um, productive purposes. The loans cannot be um, cannot be supported. They don't have enough income to support the loans, and the, and the credit bubble collapses of its own weight, which is which is the way these things all always end. So. But you know, China could keep it going for quite a lot, quite a quite a while longer. Um, uh, it's harder for us in Canada because we tend to uh, leave it up to the the free markets to decide, and uh, we're not we don't have that philosophy of actually getting in there and telling the banks who to, who to lend to and who not to lend to. I think any any government that tried to do that would uh, would would be uh, heavily criticized, if not thrown out immediately. Because we still believe in the in the letting the market decide. When and why did a home become an investment? <laughs> Good question. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's, uh, the people that came up to me after my presentation from New Zealand, Australia, um, as I mentioned, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, it's the same everywhere. Like, I, you know, I, I started out this project uh, by noticing that Canadians had adopt this idea that, that the home was what was going to secure their retirement for them, um, but it turns out, with a little bit more research, that uh, people all over the world have come to this idea. So, 
it's it's very tempting when you think about it because you don't have it's not it's not as tough as it's much easier than uh, you know denying yourself all of the travel and all the restaurant meals and all of the all of giving all the, up all the goodies and stuff and just saving the money away and then when you do save money with interest rates at zero you don't really get anywhere savings so the um, the other option I can see why people embrace it is to is to find a way to get a down payment maybe from the bank of mom and dad borrow a whole pile of money. And then just wait for house prices to rise, and then you get rich that way with little effort or little or no effort. So um, you can see why it why it was so attractive. Um, and the only way that it'll get uh, unwound is if uh, if a whole bunch of people find out it didn't work for them, and they have to get hurt financially. Unfortunately, and I, I wish there were a way out of it. And I, I you know, I I I, um, I wish there was some other way other than a whole bunch of people getting hurt. But uh, it, it doesn't appear that there is. But after studying. Um, What's happened in other countries and looking at uh, what could be done here, uh, and observing what happened in the U.S. and Ireland and Spain, um, it's um, it, it seems inevitable. Now it could be worse. Uh, Spain, in Spain, if you default on your home and declare personal bankruptcy, you're still on the hook for your mortgage. You can't get out of it. So the good news is in Canada, if you default and you declare personal bankruptcy, you're free of all. Um, you're free of all uh, obligations under your home, so you can walk away and get a, a fresh start. It's a little bit harsh. You got you got seven years of of being uh, in the in the, the the state of being a bankrupt, but at the end of seven years, you're free of uh, of your uh, obligations and you're ready to start over again. So, so there, I you know that that's an option. That's an out. In Spain, they don't even have that. So, um, so uh, unfortunately, it is going to be a difficult time for people. What kind of nest egg will boomers need to fund retirement? Well, baby boomers, if they haven't got the nest egg yet, they're they're kind of they're kind of stuck because uh, the median um, age of of baby boomers this year is sixty five. So, in this economy that we're talking about uh, happening for the next few years, um, there isn't going to be a chance to build a nest egg. The chance for the baby boomers to build a nest egg uh, was a few years ago when it was pretty easy. Uh, you know, interest rates were higher and the stock market was doing great and, uh, salaries were, were above the cost of living. But, uh, nowadays, if people haven't built a nest egg, um, they could do what I'm doing, which is continuing to work. Now, I do have a nest egg. I don't, I guess I could retire, but I don't really want to. And, um, having too much fun, but I'm sure there's lots of people that will have to work out of necessity. It's not the end of the world. I mean, maybe this whole idea of retiring when you're 65 and then living to be 95 was a uh, fiction uh, from the very beginning. And I think a lot of the people that did that had very generous pensions from, you know, the telephone company or the government or whatever. And those 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 pensions are much uh, more scarce now. So, um, uh, and of course, people are living longer now. When uh, when I first started working, the the uh, life expectancy of a male was probably 78. And now it's probably 88, so it's probably gone up 10 years just in the last half century. So, uh, so that means you have to save save up that much more money if you wanted to retire at 55 or 60 or 65. So, I suspect what's going to happen is rather than people people building up a nest egg that's big enough, because I don't really see uh, it, as I see that as being really difficult now, um, unless they buy marijuana stocks, right? So, but other than that, you know, other than that. Uh, the uh, the other only other possibility would be if interest rates went back up to ten percent, but that's probably not going to happen either. So uh, the other way that that could happen would be, I guess, just the um, continuing to work beyond the age of sixty five. I'm sure that's going to you know seventy. If people have got better health now too, so working to the age of seventy or seventy two or even longer would probably be the the new norm, if it isn't already. And for the uh, Generation Xers who are between the age of um, let's say thirty five and fifty five. It's not too late for them, but they have to start um, uh, working really hard to build a nest egg now. And uh, uh, if they've got too much debt and they're relying on their house to appreciate, um, I'd urge them to rethink that strategy and come up with a new strategy. So, and of course, the millennials—they're probably going to be the big winners. Uh, maybe not next year or the year after, but in in five or ten years from now, uh, there'll be so many baby boomers uh, unable to work. Um, uh, the, there'll be a real shortage of people to fill the job. So the, the millennials will be able to demand uh, uh, higher wages and salaries 
because there'll be in there'll be a, a real scarcity value to their to their labor. So, uh, assuming that all the jobs aren't taken over by robots first, that's the that's the only flaw in the ointment there. But, but assuming that doesn't happen, then uh, the millennials should be uh, good as long as they don't get carried away and buy a, a six hundred thousand dollar condo with five hundred ninety nine thousand dollars worth of debt. That would I would strongly I urge them strongly not to do that. If investors are no longer investing in real estate, where are they likely to put their money? Well, I think, you know, that for now, the thing to do might be just to, even though I know the savings rate is terrible, um, I think right now just the thing might be to try and learn how to uh, live a little bit, um, you know, spend a little bit less than what's coming in. So if whatever you have coming in, there always is a way to spend a little bit less and uh, just let that bank account uh, build up for a while. Interest rates are rising. You know, the GIC rates used to be half of 1%. Now they're, now the GIC rates are up to 2 or 3%. Um, and then when the, uh, when the housing bubble bursts, um, you know, I, I would wait for it to burst a little bit more. This is just the early days of that. Um, there will be some better prices on housing and there will also probably be some better prices in the Canadian stock market as well. So, uh, having a little money in the bank and letting it build up, uh, would uh, would be great uh, if the opportunity to buy assets cheaply appears, say, in uh, 12 to 24 months from now. Can stock markets remain stable during a housing market correction or collapse? Not in the Canadian stock market because um, the financial sector, we talked a minute ago about the financial sector being um, as high as 30, 35% of the, um, of the GDP. Uh, in the stock market, it's worse than that. So, in the stock market, the um, the total sector is over 35% of the total value of the stock market, and it's over 50%. This is an amazing statistic. It's over 50% of all of the profits earned on the, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So, unless the oil and gas sector were to come back, and it could, you know, if it, it could temporarily if the if there was an oil price surge to $100 a barrel. But setting that aside, there really aren't enough stocks in the Canadian stock market to overwhelm the negative effect. That a housing bubble would have on the financial services sector. So you'd have to, um, now there's a lot of different stock markets in the world. Japan, for example, has been in a slump for 28 years. So if people could invest in Japan or Germany or some of the Italy, some of those countries where the stock market is quite cheap, um, yes, there is a way to make money in the stock market, but probably not in the Canadian stock market. And, uh, of course I joke about, uh, the marijuana stocks, but they are extremely expensive. So, um, um, uh, I wish I'd gotten in a couple of years ago, but I didn't. And uh, so now that I, the way I view it now is um, everybody basically would have to smoke weed all day, every day. And even then, I don't know that you could justify these current stock prices. And I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. Where can people get a copy of the second edition of your book, When the Bubble Burst Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash? Yeah, so people can... Um, Get it on Amazon, either Amazon.com or Amazon.ca. They can get it on Kindle, or they can get it in the Chapters Indigo or any bookstore that uh, uh, any Canadian bookstore. It's in all the bookstores. Um, I just got a, a note from the publisher uh, this morning. It said that it was in the top five of all books selling in their in their list. So now that's just one publisher, but they're one of the biggest publishers in Canada. So, um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, all of the books that they brought to this conference disappeared very quickly so i i think that the topic has has really caught people's attention recently so the first edition came out uh more than three years ago um a little bit early maybe but i you know in order to help people it would have to be a little bit early uh i think now the the it's it's right the timeliness is just about perfect right now so um i'm sure they'll have lots of supply in the bookstores uh and um uh, I, I, I encourage people to read it and, and, and also contact me and let me know uh, what you think. If you do get a chance to read it, I'd be interested in getting feedback on that. How do they get a hold of you? Uh, they can get my, uh, through the website, themacbethgroup.com. There's a way to uh, email me, send me a message. Um, also on Twitter, um, my Twitter handle is uh, at HMACBE. And um, there's quite an active uh, Twitter community talking about uh, Canadian economics, um, the housing bubble, all kinds of interesting topics. And I also do a weekend note, so uh, people can register for free to receive in their email uh, box um, uh, my weekend note. This week I wrote 
uh, about the conference and a couple of really interesting investment ideas that I picked up from the conference. Hilliard, thank you very much for being on the show. Nice to be with you again, Jim. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. Coming up, Wolf Street publisher Wolf Richter, next on This Week in Money. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Wolf Richter, publisher of wolfstreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Wolf, welcome back to This Week in Money. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Wolf, how is President Donald Trump handling the trade issues with the U.S.'s biggest trading partners? Well, the trade dispute has really gotten muddled. Uh, that that's for sure. And there, uh, yeah, let me explain first why this is really important and why I'm really glad that Trump is, uh, is addressing this, uh, because the United States has had a unsustainable, uh, a trade deficit for the last two decades. And it's getting bigger and bigger every year. Our good trade uh, deficit in, in, in goods was, uh, uh, close to $600 billion last year. Uh, in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, in, in terms of goods and services, it was uh, close to $600 billion. Uh, goods deficit alone was close to $800 billion last year. Um, the If you take petroleum products out of it, it was uh, about $730 billion. I mean, these are huge numbers that were upside down in the United States, and they're just getting bigger and bigger. And this year looks to be even worse than last year. Last year was the worst since, since 2008. And, uh, our goods, uh, uh, trade deficit with China, Japan, and Germany combined is, uh, like $450 billion, just these three countries combined. So these are huge numbers. And, uh, a trade deficit is, uh, uh, is a negative for GDP. So it deducts from the economy just like, uh, trade surplus would, would add to the economy. And, uh, so I think it is very important that the United States uh, deal with this. I've said this for years, and I've been poo-pooed uh, <laughs> about it for years. And so now finally Trump is, is addressing this, but the debate is not getting completely bungled. And there there are uh, two elements here to look at. One is uh, the trade policies of other countries such as China, uh, where there's not a level uh, playing field for American companies, and were there big tariffs for, on imports like, like China has had uh, on, on imports of cars and those kinds of things, they're protecting their own markets. So that's one one element is the, the policies of, the, of the, your trading partner. The other element, and it's the dominating element, is corporate America. Nobody forces corporate America to route its supply chain through China. So this is a decision that is made by corporate America. When, uh, and you know, Germans say, uh, well, America doesn't make any cars that we want to buy. And well, the, we sell a few cars in Germany. But the thing is, uh, corporate America decided to make cars in Germany. So when I was growing up in Germany, I was growing up when I was a kid in Germany, uh, back in the day, you know, I thought Ford was a German company. I, I just, you know, I thought it was a German company uh, when I was, you know, six years old. I thought this because all were made that were sold in Germany were made in Germany. There were big factories in Germany. Uh there were those Fords were different than American Fords. And uh you know Ford had been in Germany since since after since probably before World War One and as an initial distribution outfit and uh and then became much bigger later on. GM bought Opel uh, in Germany uh after World War One and uh so you know everybody thinks uh in germany and yeah, i thought of opel as a german company but it was really an american company until it got sold to a french company just a couple of years ago 
Um, and so America, corporate America is out there doing business, but, uh, they don't like to produce in the United States and export in general, you know. So it's, it's a kind of a one-sided thing. And, uh, and they love to route the supply chain through cheap countries. Uh, there are different reasons for that, and corporate America is always in search of cheap labor. Uh, and there, you know, the, and other, uh, cost savings such as environmental issues, uh, that are, you know, d- cheaper to deal with in other countries. And so they, uh, naturally they will try to cut the cost by doing that. And they have a very large and significant, uh, tax benefit, uh, in, in our tax code here in the United States in that, uh, transfer pricing. So when they bring in goods that they produced overseas in the United States, they can price them up at a fairly high price to where the U.S. entity makes relatively small amounts of money on this product when it's sold in the United States, whereas the foreign entity makes a large part of those profits, and those profits aren't taxed uh, in the United States until they're repatriated, uh, which is uh, which you don't have to do. You know, you can set up a uh, 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 an entity in Ireland or in some other tax haven, you know, where where these uh, Profits are stored untaxed, so to speak, and this is where the hundreds of billions of dollars of untaxed profits are sitting in the United, uh, from, from corporate America right now. And, uh, yeah, this is so-called cash overseas. Of course, it's not overseas. It's invested in U.S. securities, uh, but it is registered overseas. And now we have a, a new tax code that, that uh, provide special treatment to repatriate those, those untaxed profits. So there's a very large <clears throat> tax incentive uh, for corporate America to offshore. And uh, so these are the the two things we have to really keep in mind when we talk about trade policy is, one, what other countries are doing uh, at home at their, uh, in, in, in their environment <clears throat> to create the kind of uh, trade uh, balance that, uh, that they want. And the other is corporate America. Corporate America is really the dominating factor in the United States. You know, we got to also keep in mind that it's a lot easier to blame, quote unquote, China or blame, quote unquote, Mexico or Canada <coughs> for the trade problems we're having uh, because it's just one word and it's easy to do. And that's what that's a trap Trump has fallen into. The trade relationship with Canada is uh, is probably the best that the United States has. You know, we have a small good trade deficit with Canada, and you throw in services, and we may have a small surplus. It is very well balanced. Uh, Canada is the uh, third largest supplier uh, source of imports for the United States after Mexico and China, but it's also the largest uh, recipient of our exports. So... <clears throat> Yeah, any trade relationship can be improved, and there are probably things to renegotiate in NAFTA in terms of uh, the Canadian and U.S. relationship. Uh, but that is, among our trading partners, you know, the relationship between the U.S. and Canada is unique, and it is really well balanced, and it's not the issue. You know, this is not a problem that uh, we need to put on the front pages of the newspaper. Our problem is with, with China and Germany and Japan and who buy very little from the United States, uh, who have uh, industrial policies. All three of them have industrial policies uh, that protect their own markets, their own industries, uh, and that further exports from their own industries. And, uh, yeah, these are, these are country-specific issues we need to address. At the same time, when this needs to be done, in the prop, uh, appropriate channels, you know, in general in the United States, that means that this Congress uh, should be involved and there's not the White House. Um, so, uh, yeah, when, when you deal with countries like this, uh, uh, it, yeah, it's an international issue, but when you deal with corporate America, it's a domestic issue. And, uh, uh, corporate America just got this huge tax cut. And they got an enormous tax cut effective this year. And, you know, they didn't pass it on to consumers or to workers. That, you know, that got passed on to executives and shareholders. And, uh, so now a tariff, tariffs would be, uh, would be a relatively small tax on, on imports for those companies. And, uh, it would be like a sin tax, like taxing alcohol, which, which we do in the United States. Every tax has Two effects. One, it raises money for the government, and two, it it changes behavior in that whoever's being taxed is trying to evade that tax, 
And so they're changing their behavior. So maybe they drink less alcohol uh, to avoid the alcohol taxes. Or in terms of tariffs, corporate America will try to import a little less and source a little bit more from the United States to uh, cut its costs in terms of tariffs. Now, tariffs are, are a tax on uh, uh, margin, on profit margin. And uh, they are not uh, a tax on consumers because companies already charge the maximum price in the United States that they can get away with. They're, you know, prices are, are determined by market forces. They're not determined by cost. And uh, market forces are such that if GM wanted to slap a $5,000 additional price on a vehicle that is on the tariffs that it imports from Mexico, yeah, consumers would just laugh. GM already can't import, can sell its cars without without big uh, rebates. So, I mean, they're they're charging the maximum amount they can in order to produce the sales they want. So those tariffs cannot be passed on to consumers largely. They will be eaten by companies that got a huge tax cut uh, already. So now they're getting a little bit of a tax increase, and and that should just stop squealing as far as I'm concerned. But this is where, where uh, President Trump really has bungled the debate, and that is clear why this is, because this is the most uh, pro-corporate America White House that I I, I uh, I remember. And so, yeah, they're not going after corporate America, even though Trump will tweet occasionally about one or the other company, you know, but there, there is no appetite at this White House to increase taxes for corporate America after they've gotten this big tax cut. So it's a, uh, it's a situation where, uh, yeah, the, the issues aren't really separated out. So the, there's two issues in trade. One is, uh, the, you know, the, 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 trade policies of other countries uh, that protect their markets and protect their own industries, and they need to be addressed, particularly with uh, China and Japan. Those are the, the biggest culprits in that area. And uh, and the other factor is corporate America, and that's domestic. And uh, if you put tariffs on corporate America, uh, that's a, you know, a form of syntax. Congress needs to do that. Congress needs to get involved. And that's messy and it's complicated to do and the White House didn't want to do that. Um, you know, and, and there's resistance and there's lobbying and, and you don't know what you can get done. Uh, but it should have been packaged together with a tax cut that corporate America got. And so, yeah, they're getting a big cut over here and they're getting a slight tax increase over there. And that's how it should have, this should have been packaged together and, and passed through Congress that way. Uh, now, this is not happening, and I doubt that uh, the trade policies uh, Trump is now trying to, to put in place, these willy-nilly tariffs all over the place, that everybody's resisting. Corporate America's resisting it, and everybody's resisting it. Yeah, um, yeah I doubt this will, will actually work the way this is being done, you know, and uh, so... Uh, you know, we do need to address the unsustainable trade deficits of the United States. Uh, every year, uh, you know, other countries are abusing this. Uh, corporate America is abusing this, and it needs to be stopped. It needs to be brought into balance. But I'm afraid that the way we're going about it is uh, is, is not happening. And I actually wrote a letter to the White House uh uh, in July to sort of explain uh, how this needs to be pitched, that there's two issues that need to be separated and they need to be addressed separately. And corporate America, tariffs in corporate America need to be handled by Congress. And uh, uh, and so, but obviously, you know, they're, uh, they're, they've got their own reasons for uh, for not going after corporate America. And uh, and so I don't think this is happening. Um, and uh, And I think it's a shame that uh, the uh, the trade dispute between Canada and the United States uh, has has reached this level because it's really uh, I mean we're really the the best trading partners you can envision. It, it's so balanced, you know. Yeah, sure. There's there's little things here and there that should be tweaked. You know, where Canada should give some and where the United States should give some. But uh, in general, you know, this is nothing to complain about. And uh, we, we, as far as the United States uh, trade policy is concerned, there is much bigger fish to fry, uh, particularly uh, with in terms of other countries now, with uh, Japan and China and Germany too. And uh, uh, and then obviously the dominating problem is corporate America. 
We'll have more with Wolf Richter when This Week in Money returns. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Wolf Richter. Wolf, will interest rates continue to rise? And if they do, how will that impact housing in Canada and the U.S.? Well, in the United States, uh, we are on a very gradual but a very persistent rate hike path. So... Uh, Last year, we got three rate hikes. This year, likely we're going to get four rate hikes. It started in two, 2015 with one and another one in 2016. Uh, so it's speeding up a little bit. Uh, and, uh, in, in his press conference today, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, uh, said very clearly that this is not going to stop anytime soon unless something big changes. Uh, they're going to continue to hike rates, so you know, we'll get four this year. We we may get four next year. Um, you know, if we get uh, if we get four rate hikes next year, four this year and four next year, um, our uh, short term rates are going to be at three and a half percent, and that's still relatively low historically speaking. Uh, but considering that the word zero percent, this is a massive adjustment for the economy. And, uh, the, the good thing is that they, yeah, they're going at about half the speed of, of, uh, more recent, uh, of, of the last rate hike cycle. Uh, last time was in 2004 to 2006. And the Greenspan Fed hiked, uh, four percentage points in two years. Uh, now we're almost Three years into it, and uh, we we got our we got our two percentage points in. So, I mean, this will take many years. So, the economy has time to adjust. Uh, Canada is probably a little slower uh, in its rate hikes than, than we will be, uh, but they're yeah you know, they're they're coming, and they've already uh, Bank of Canada has already raised rates, and and they will continue to do so very gradually. I think around the world. Uh, gradual is going to be the the name of the game. Uh, they're going to raise rates in Europe pretty soon, so um, this is something uh, that will will impact the global economy in many ways. Now, in terms of housing in the United States and Canada, there are some big differences. In uh, both countries, we have cities with major housing bubbles, so there's there's some real risks involved. Uh, the housing bubbles in Canada are probably more significant than they are, uh, in some of the cities in the United States. Uh, but there are, I mean, there are overpriced markets and they are at risk. In the United States, the standard mortgage is a 30 year fixed rate. So when you buy a home today and you get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage on it, your interest rate does not change for the next 40 years. And even though that interest rate may be higher, so right now the average is around 5% already, uh, <clears throat> You, uh, you will never have to worry about that interest rate rising. So it's, uh, it, you can budget for that. It's fixed. And as you make more money, as you go down, uh, as, you, as you go up your career ladder, you know, go down with life, uh, it becomes a little easier to bear. And this is, this is, uh, this protects consumers somewhat. In Canada, you have adjustable rate mortgages and variable rate mortgages that dominate. So some mortgages, many mortgages, uh, adjust almost instantly to rate increases. And, uh, and then there are other mortgages where you have a fixed rate for five years and then they adjust. So higher rates impact, uh, existing homeowners in Canada. They don't really impact, uh, existing homeowners in the United States. So new homeowners, in the United States have to deal with uh, higher rates. And so they're having to finance these overpriced homes at a uh, 30 year, with a 30 year mortgage that now uh, has an interest rate of 5% instead of 3.5% a couple of years ago. Uh, and they cannot do that. So they have to 
to uh, look for a cheaper home or they're locked out of the market entirely. Now, rates are still low, and I expect a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage to hit 6% sometime next year um, and maybe go past that, at which point the high-priced markets in the United States will become unaffordable for a lot of people, and prices will have to come down to keep the market from freezing up. So this will put pressure on pricing. Uh, it will be probably relatively slow. I don't think we'll see a, a housing collapse like we had last time, but it could be very drawn out. Uh, uh, you know, interest rates in the United States have been on a downtrend for 35 years, and I think this is over. This we we hit zero. You know, this is this is uh, this area is over. They may not go back where they were 30 years ago, but. Uh, you know, when when uh, when inflation in 1981, inflation was uh, 15% in the United States, and money markets returned 18%, and mortgages uh, were 19% or something. You know, I don't think we'll we'll see these uh, times again unless we have a really big bout of inflation. But interest rates are going up, and uh, and so home buying will get more expensive. Incomes are not coming up uh, like they should, and so. Uh, you know, there's, it's just a matter of, of basic math in terms of new homeowners, people who are wanting to buy a home, who can't afford it, who have to either step down or forego it, and the market will eventually respond by, by cutting prices. We're already seeing that. I mean, we're already seeing all kinds of price reductions cropping up all over the United States. Home sales have slowed down. Some markets have already turned. Uh, so this is starting to, to have an effect. Now, in Canada, uh, the problem is, the bigger problem is existing homeowners. Uh, and you have to keep in mind, when we went through our mortgage crisis here, a big part of the problem were homeowners with adjustable rate mortgages. Those used to be a big deal. Uh, and uh, so when, when mortgages reset to higher rates, they couldn't afford uh, those, those payments. And some of them, some of the adjustable rate mortgages had very low teaser rates for the first year or two, and then they set to, to, to higher rates. And so adjustable rate mortgages were a big part of the problem in the, in the collapse of the housing market in the United States. Uh, and the, in effect, the, the mortgage crisis essentially killed adjustable rate mortgages in the United States. They're now coming back up, and about 6% of our mortgages are adjustable rate. Um, the rest of them are a fixed rate, and uh, but that was down to one percent after the financial crisis, and and before the financial crisis it was around twenty percent. So uh, these adjustable rate mortgages in an environment of rising interest rates are are deadly, and they're deadly for existing homeowners because your 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 mortgage payments go up, and you can't budget for it. You don't know uh, what. Uh, the interest rate is going to be five years from now, and hopefully you'll make more money five years from now than you do today because you may have to pay much higher mortgage rates, or if you're on a variable rate mortgage that are charged immediately, your next mortgage payment may already be higher. So um, it it impacts not only future home buyers who may not be able to afford those homes, but it impacts current home buyers. And so the risk shifts uh, to consumers, to households. And we've seen that with adjusted rate mortgages in the United States during the housing bust. This is a pernicious thing that can happen. And uh, it is something I think that com- Canadian homeowners will have to struggle with. And that's one of the – the Bank of Canada is aware of this. You know, that's one of the reasons why they will go fairly slow because if they go a little bit too fast, uh, existing homeowners – Many, and many meaning 10%. If 10% of your homeowners default, you've got a mortgage crisis like we had in the United States. So it doesn't mean that all homeowners are at risk. It means that you're the most vulnerable homeowners default. And that if that number is 10% of, of, uh, the people with mortgages, you know, that will bring down your banks. And there's no financial system that can deal with something like that. That happened in the United States. And if that happens in Canada, you know, that will bring down your banks. So, uh, yeah, the, the Bank of Canada will be careful to, 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 to try to avoid that, uh, to get that kind of mortgage crisis. But even if you get a, a default rate of 3% or 4%, it's a major problem. And uh, with adjustable rate mortgages, that's very easy to do. When your mortgage payment goes uh, from you know, $2,000 to $2,400, uh, you know, suddenly your $400 
uh, out of whack. You, you, where are you going to get this money, you know, on a monthly basis? Maybe you just squeak by for a little while. But, uh, you know, so for vulnerable households, this is a, a, a very risky time to be in. And, uh, and so I think Canadian banks are going to have a problem, or banks and mortgage lenders in general are going to have a problem on their hands as interest rates are rising. The problem will likely play out very slowly. Uh, hopefully <laughs> as rates go up slowly, you know, you don't have this all at once. Uh, so you, you spread it out over over a number of years and, and somehow uh, get the banks and mortgage lenders to 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 survive this. Uh, in the United States, during the mortgage bust, the uh, the lenders that were let go were the non-bank lenders, so the shadow banks, uh, so to speak, the the banks or the lenders that fund their loans not from deposits but from uh, issuing bonds and securitizing mortgages. And since uh, they didn't take deposits, they weren't a further big risk to to the economy, and they were let go. They just collapsed. And and when it started impacting bigger banks, uh, some of the medium-sized banks and thrifts, you know, were let go. But when it started to impact the big banks, you know, they were bailed out at a at a very large expense, and uh, and something that American. Uh, taxpayers and, and consumers will probably uh, not forgive our authorities here for another 25 years. I mean, that was something that was one of the most hated activities that has been done, <clears throat> and um, you know, it continues to to dog us today. Uh, Canada is looking at a similar scenario. I think we'll have more with Wolf Richter when this week in money returns. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Wolf Richter. Wolf, is the so-called Trump bump in the U.S. economy a myth? It is actually a um, a reality, and uh, it is, it became apparent right after the election, before he even was in office. Suddenly, um, not only in the financial markets, but in other in other areas too, and now it it's the good space sector, it, which is booming. Imports are booming despite everything. Uh, Companies are ordering, uh, consumers are spending, particularly uh, online. So uh, uh, online retail is doing very well, rising by 15, 16 percent uh, on an annual basis. Brick and mortar retail is not doing so well, but that's structural. That will never change. It'll just gradually disappear. Much of it, a good part of it. Uh, there's an entire warehouse industry now springing up to supply uh, the. Uh, online retail sector with fulfillment infrastructure, uh, and even auto sales ticked up. The entire transportation sector is, is really on cloud nine. Uh, trucking companies, uh, and railroads, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're having record business. There's driver shortages. That, that's what they're complaining about. Freight rates are skyrocketing. Uh, you know, it, it's now taking longer to get stuff shipped because everybody's at capacity. Uh, you know, the, the freight expenses for, for, uh, shippers for companies like Walmart and others, you know, they are, are sore and they're complaining about it. There's some inflationary impact there. Uh, higher oil prices have, uh, have revived the oil patch in the United States, which is, which is very large. You know, the United States is now, uh, the largest or has become the largest oil producer in the world. So this is a, a, a big part of the economy in those states. And uh, there's a lot of investment now going on, uh, and that has boosted the economy in those areas. Uh, we can see that in, in, in trucking companies, too, that, that uh, ship equipment to those areas. So we see the flatbed trailer rate skyrocketing. I mean, it's just amazing what's happening. And uh, in the Bay Area where I live, um, yeah, the, the economy is red hot. 
And, uh, I mean, you can't drive anywhere. Everything is congested. There are lots of tourists. Uh, the, uh, the, in the, in the tech economy, salaries are skyrocketing. Um, even housing, you know, now, <laughs> San Francisco is not exactly a hotbed, uh, for, for, for Trump voters. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to his policies here, but, you know, uh, our housing situation in San Francisco started flatlining or maybe peaking in 2015, 2016. Condo prices were already declining. A lot of supply coming on the market. Trump gets elected and suddenly everything just prices boom again. <laughs> suddenly jump. And so this spring, for example, we had this, this huge burst in home prices in, in San Francisco. Uh, employment is up. Uh, I mean, every, every data point you look at, uh, in in the Bay Area since the Trump election has uh, has surged, and uh, some of this is, uh, uh, is 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 temporary, you know. So uh, a lot of the stuff that gets shipped goes into inventory because people are worried about uh, supply chain problems because of the the delays in shipping. So they're ordering more, they're stocking more. We see the inventory numbers going up, uh, and has been for for well over a year. Uh, so that that goes into the economy, but it's just on the shelf, so to speak. Eventually, they're going to stop ordering or slow down ordering uh, in order to sell off the inventory that's got. And we've seen that in 2014 when inventories were rising very sharply. We had a similar bump at that uh, during that year. And then in 2015, 2016, those inventories needed to be worked off. And the goods producing sector essentially went into a recession. The service economy remained strong, but the goods producing uh, economy essentially went to a recession in the United States, and uh, the transportation sector uh, went into a severe recession. There were layoffs uh, among truck manufacturers because trucking companies stopped ordering trucks. I mean, the whole thing just kind of collapsed temporarily, and uh, and and this this has completely changed. Now we're now we're in the boom period uh, as opposed to the bust period of 2015 and 2016. 2014 was a boom period, so it's a very cyclical environment. And despite the, the recession in the goods-producing economy in the United States in 2015 and 16, the service economy was strong enough and, and overall economy remained positive that the growth in 2016 in the United States was only 1.6%. And that was uh, based exclusively on growth in the service sector as the goods producing sector was actually in decline. Uh, right now, this is the opposite. I mean, the service is doing good, but the goods producing sector is really hot. And, uh, uh, yeah, this is showing up in, in – this is real economy. This is mainstream uh, – Main Street economy that we're seeing here being impacted. Uh, the uh, spending – Increased spending by the government uh, and the tax cuts too, but mainly the increased spending are boosting the economy as well. Uh, the United States is going to borrow this fiscal year an additional $1.4 trillion to fund those expenditures and, and the tax cuts. That's, uh, you know, for an economy that's moving forward at a good clip, that is a huge deficit to have. You should have a surplus. When the, when the economy is moving like this, you should have a, a slight surplus and have this kind of deficit when you're in a deep recession. Yeah, now we're having this kind of deficit when, when, uh, when the economy is booming, you know, and, and we're not talking about the deficit. This is an increase in debt. So this is an, an actual a dollar amount that we have borrowed to fund, um, to fund the expenditures. And, uh, with a deficit, you can play games, you know, you can play accounting games, but with the debt, you cannot. So this is the only reliable number that, uh, that I can see in terms of government finances. You can't, you can't monkey around with this. And, uh, and, you know, this is going to be, we're going to add to our debt $1.4 trillion this fiscal year. This fiscal year is going to be over in the, at the end of September. So we'll know the precise number here pretty, sh- pretty, pretty shortly. Uh, and it, it's just huge. You know, this is a huge stimulus for the economy, but it's also a huge burden for the future. And, uh, uh, so I, I think the Trump bump is very real, uh, and it's very temporary. Yeah, you know, this cannot go on for a number of reasons, including the inventory buildup in the goods producing sector. 
uh, the huge deficit. At some point, there's going to be a problem with that. Uh, right now, it's still working, but interest rates are going up. You know, this is going to get a lot more expensive to fund for the United States, and uh, there are going to be problems uh, on the financial side of it. Uh, so I think this will really look like a bump, you know, where it goes up and it goes down. And uh, I'm, I'm fully intent of tracking that with charts, you know, because I've already charted the, the uptrend, and, and and I'm waiting for an inflection point when the goods-producing sector uh, uh, starts to, to hit the slowdown as it did in 2015. You know, we're we're going to see that. And uh, uh, But meanwhile, you know, the... Uh, and this is as strong an economy as we've seen in a long time in the United States. Wolf, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you, Tim. My guest has been Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Maxime Bernier, Hilliard Macbeth, and Wolf Richter. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for company showcase updates from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray and Avon Resources CEO Jim Pettit. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray. Larry, welcome back to the show. Hi, Jim. Larry, what's happening with cobalt and recycling right now? Well, the amounts of cobalt are being reduced in the uh, batteries. So I got an interesting uh, uh, bit on cobalt here just recently. And it says, uh, you know, basically that uh, there's about a dozen or 11 top producers and anywhere from 25.9 kilowatt, kilo, kilograms, mega kilograms or uh, right down to uh, 1.2 or 1.7, 1.9, I should say. So we, I figured, well, let's take, do some figuring on that and just see where do we sit in this whole thing as a supplier of cobalt once we get up and running as a recycler. And, uh, of course, Mutanda of Glencorp is the biggest producer at uh, about 24 kilotons, and uh, Tanki of uh, China is 16.5, and then it drops right down to uh, 5 from Russia, and right down to uh, the uh, Kavita at uh, Morocco, which is about uh, 1.92 kilotons. So looking at the uh, recycling opportunity we have, you do a little figuring and figure we're talking about a 3-ton per day demonstration plant, but let's go to 30-ton per day, yes, but still a pretty small plant. 30 ton per day would put us in as a, uh, a producer at 1.32 kilot- kilotons. So you can do the math on that and just see how fast uh, this amount can grow. So what that means is that uh, people are not factoring in that uh, Amy could be a supplier. Now, if we were, uh, we had an ore body that we were developing and we were going to produce 1.2 kilotons a year, we'd be getting a lot more attention. And uh, what folks have to realize is that we are, you know, working hard to have a a total circular economy with this. Uh, No waste streams, uh, getting 100% of the cathodes, that's really important to us because uh, that, you know, gets rid of any kind of a waste stream that we might have. So... We're working hard at that, and uh, in that regard, uh, you know, Cometco are still waiting for some prefabricated parts for the uh, pilot plant. I know that's uh, 
Uh, it's a bit of a uh, agony for my shareholders, but it's also a big agony for the management too. You know, we'd like to see that progressing further. But you know, getting into the, I just wanted people to realize that uh, there is uh, uh, a place for Amy in this uh, market. The uh, Recycling International came out with some numbers on uh, the amount of uh, EVs, uh, EV uh, revenues out to two. Out, they're starting in 2028, and what they're saying is that by 2028 that the uh, recycling of lith- uh, lithium-ion batteries will be a $22 billion business each year. That's a lot of money. That's a B, not an M. And uh, it shows you that we're in the right space at the right time. So this is a uh, this is just kind of a, a uh, showing, showing everybody that their patients will be rewarded. I mean... Uh, one thing we do know, we do know that we have a process. The uh, patent application is back in. I said before that was to do more with the uh, with the verbiage in the uh, in the uh, patent application, and uh, then certainly there was no uh, conflicts with any other kind of technologies out there. So we do know that we get a hundred percent back, and we do know that. Uh, that uh, there's nobody else in that field, and there's certainly nobody that's encroaching on our uh, on our uh, patent pending. So these things are all encouraging. Uh, what this tells me is that we're in the right spot at the right time, and uh, it's only a matter of time till uh, people recognize that. Uh, you know, like I just gave you numbers on 30 tons per day. 30 tons per day. That's scraps. I'm sorry. I didn't, uh, I didn't verify that the last time, but 30 tons of scraps per day would make us the, uh, 12th largest producer of cobalt. So if you went up to 100 tons per day, you know, you'd be up in the, uh, 7th, 8th bracket. So, uh, or at least the, uh, not number 9. It could be number 9 or number 10 or, uh, even number 8. And, uh, so, that really, kind of puts in perspective uh, we're not mining ore but we are mining batteries and uh, we can calculate what's in those batteries and by the way those uh, all these numbers come from a thousand pound battery and uh, or a 500 kilogram battery now we just standardize that number to for easy work it could be uh, 700 600 could be 1100 and uh but it doesn't matter we get down to the batteries and we uh we disassemble those batteries so this is a uh this is the opportunity that we have and uh i just wanted to you know point this out to uh to everybody that this is a big business coming up you know certainly there's lots of room for different recycling opportunities and uh you know, it's. Uh, I think we could end up being uh, one of the majors in that field. So people should look at the uh, at the uh, numbers where we sit in the uh, pecking order. And uh, I'll give you an example. You know, I've given you the uh, the uh, Mutanda uh, twenty three point nine kilotons and uh then I gave you uh a tanky which was uh, 16.05 kilotons the next one is uh ruashi at 4.6 kilotons moa and most of these by the way are in uh, the DRC um that uh, moa's in uh, cuba 3.6 kilotons you can see that if we went to 90 tons a day, we'd be up there with Cuba. Ramu, Papua New Guinea, 3.31 kilotons. Mbatabi, it's in Madagascar, 3.05 kilotons. And Goro, VNC Goro, is uh, a nickel cobalt mine in New Caledonia, 2.78 kilotons. 
and the uh, Blue Azure, 1.92 kilotons of cobalt uh, in Morocco. So those are the numbers, and that's what you have to think about. You have to think, gee, uh, you know, we're talking 30 tons here, and we're we're number uh, we're number 12. If we were at 100 tons, there's a good chance we would be moving up the ladder. And 100 tons is not that big. And, of course, when we get into the batteries, then uh, the tons are going to move up quite rapidly. But it looks like we could have a real big business in scraps and uh, work out any bugs that we have in the commercial plant. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, people have to realize that uh, we're in the right space the timing might be a little bit off, but uh, it won't be long before uh, people recognize that uh, this could be a uh, an opportunity. Larry, Jim, where are you traded, and how can people get more information about American Manganese? We're traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY. We're traded in the U.S. under the symbol AMYZF. We're traded in uh, Frankfurt, Germany, under the symbol 2AM. They can get all the information that they uh, they desire at our website, AmericanManganeseInc.com, or they can uh, phone me at uh, 778-574-4444, or email me at L-R-E-A-U-G-H at A-M-Y-M-N.com. Larry, thanks for the update. You're welcome. I'm Jim Goddard. I've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Our conversation took place on September 28th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Jim Pettit, CEO and President of Avon Resources. Jim, you just put out a news release? Yeah, it came out actually two days ago. Uh, we reported on eight holes, uh, which were all drilled right around the high-grade holes that we uh, encountered last year and the, the beginning of this season, too. Um, they were, you know, those were exceptionally high grades, especially the first hole this year that we reported a couple months ago. Um, and now what we've done is some step-out holes to the northeast to the southwest um, and then turned around from the southwest and drilled quite a ways to the north. Um, so we basically got it initially surrounded, and we've had success. We've, uh, we've got good mineralization in uh, basically in, in six of the eight holes. The step outs were probably 30 meters, 25 to 30 meters. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them are pretty good. You, you, you get, uh, five grams over 12 meters in one of the holes. That included 24 grams over two meters. Um, we've got 23 meters over two grams. In another one of the holes, we've got, um, 3.2 grams over 15 meters, uh, included in that was 11 grams over 2 meters. Um, and what it shows is we've got, still have mineralization. Um, and it, you know, it's still open in all directions. So we've, you know, we've got our work cut out for us, but, um, that was eight holes out of so far a 36 hole drill program. Um, initially we started out to hopefully do 18 holes. Uh, we're now up to 36. And, uh, and growing, uh, we've raised a lot of money, uh, since we started drilling. So, you know, we're in good shape there with over seven million in the treasury. Uh, we'll be good until, well, we've got enough money to get us through next year's program too. So we don't have to raise more money. Um, the, uh, the market responded in, in, I guess what would be a, a, uh, predictable way for the golden triangle because it's now getting into September. So you create liquidity um, and shareholders, people who want out are getting out. Uh, We can see that. Uh, We've traded about 10 million shares and uh, trading at 21 cents. Down a bit, but that's okay. We've got 27 more holes to report on. 
Um, and uh, it actually looks, uh, everything looks pretty good. I mean, you know, we've still got the south boundary zone to, to, to come out. Uh, we've got three holes to come out with there. Um, I suspect that will be next week, um, possibly after the weekend. Um, and then lots more. We'll have news going through into November easily. Um, and then this winter we've got our other projects that we'll be gearing up. So it actually looks pretty good for the, for the season. And I think we're probably trading in a range right now where if we were to end tomorrow, this is probably where we'll go, but we've got more holes to come out with. And I think we'll see, uh, you know, the market respond positively, uh, to good news. What kind of message will you be taking to people at the Vancouver Metals Investors Forum? Um, more of the same. Uh, we've got a lot, a lot more holes to report on. Um, you know, this is pretty close to what happened last year, and I think the other companies are experiencing a bit of a down dip when when you do put news out now. But I think we've got a lot of that out of the way. Um, you know, you've got the people trading, and and they knew what was you know any kind of news. Please give us the liquidity because it's time to go. And now we've got a good steady flow of news coming. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be positive for the company. Where is Abin traded and how can people find out more information about it? Abin's traded on the, uh, Toronto, uh, the Venture Exchange, Toronto, uh, Stock Exchange, um, under the symbol ABN.V. And, uh, you can contact the company, uh, at, uh, 604-687-3376 or info at Avon Resources. Jim, thanks for the update. You bet. Thanks. I've been speaking with Jim Pettit, CEO and President of Avon Resources. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on September 27th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.